guys excited and ready to talk about sexuality today? <laughs> Some of you are. I, I didn't even think I'd get a laugh out of that. Actually, you know, sex and sexuality is something that is really difficult to talk about. And, you know, I, I don't mean to be holding myself up and saying, oh, poor me, but it's an extremely difficult thing to talk about, too, especially to a group like this. And I was thinking about this uh, as I was putting the sermon together. You know, if I had a group of just guys, I would preach this or talk about this a, a certain way. And if I had a group of just women, then I would probably talk about it, uh, you know, a, a much different way. And then if I, if I had a group of, of kids or young people, I would certainly talk about it a, a completely uh, other way as well. It's just, it's just one of those difficult topics. On the other hand, our sexuality touches uh, so many different things, things that we uh, don't even think about. I, I mean, uh, think about um, uh, just the presentation that we had at the beginning of the service uh, from Jen and Jackie working at Anchor of Hope. I mean, you have uh, women getting pregnant, oftentimes out of wedlock, and coming in and trying to decide what to do because they're dealing and they're trying to navigate um, the consequences of a broken sexuality or, uh, you know, out-of-bounds sexual behavior. Um, so you have the issue of abortion. Now, we've all heard these statistics about, about marriage that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the percentages have changed a little bit in the last 10 years, but, you know, it, it, you know it's pretty common to, to think that, that half of marriages are going to fail. Okay, now, now marriage is the institution, marriage is, is that, that, that uh, situation that God created to, to put boundaries around our sexuality, to, uh, to give uh, kind of a, a vehicle for uh, expressing our sexuality in, in the most uh, proper, in the most life-giving, in the most uh, edifying way. And yet we see that the institution of marriage is in, is in huge trouble in this country. Uh, whether it's 50% or not. I mean, another alarming thing that I've heard is that, that when you go uh, from inside the church to outside the church, the percentages really don't change that much. And then you have the issue in our society of pornography. I mean, the statistics there, I, I could hardly believe them. They are so shocking, so shocking. About 7 out of 10, 70% of men uh, view pornography on a regular basis, and the percentages for women are between 30 and 40%, some people say, and that, that percentage is uh, even on the rise. That's on the rise even more so than men. I mean, shocking statistics, shocking statistics, and all of them are related to or directly touching uh, the issue of sexuality. It is a huge huge issue in our society and in our lives. I'm sure it's a huge issue in this church. And yet, it's something that we don't like to talk about. It's something that we don't like to be confrontational about. It's something that we don't like to hear about. It's something that we don't like to be completely honest about. And that just compounds and, and exponentially uh, compounds the, the problem that this, that this is, the fact that we can't talk about it. Fortunately for us, Jesus did not shy away from issues like this. Jesus stood up and told it like it is. And that's exactly what he is doing this week in our reading, just just uh, four simple verses, but, but a statement made with authority. Jesus addresses this issue of our sexuality. Now, I mentioned all the, all the different areas of life, all the different aspects that our sexuality touches. Sex in our society is, is oversold and, and it's undervalued. 
It's portrayed on the one hand as, as the key or the, 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 the primary thing in our, in our security and in our intimacy and in our feelings of significance. And then on the other hand, uh, it's treated um, in the media and in our society as, as little more than, than just a, a self-gratification with, with no strings attached. That's just the reality. Uh, we live in a society that has all kinds of mixed messages about our sexuality. And this morning, I want to explore a little bit, not just standing on a soapbox and saying, oh, this is what's wrong with our world, this is what's wrong with our society, and, and what are we going to do? But I want to explore also the positive side of sexuality. So, so before I go any further, maybe I should back up just a little bit. Sex is uh, not an evil, it's not an inappropriate, and it's not a shameful thing. In fact, sexuality is uh, an important aspect of our humanity. And we're not talking about just our fallen humanity. Sexuality is part of how we were made, and we express it in all kinds of ways, not just in, in sexual intercourse. I mean, our sexuality is, is present in the ways that we relate to one another, whether it's within our marriage or whether it's outside of our marriage. It's, pre it's present in, in our friendships, and, and when we show affection to one another, uh, it's, it's present in touching and caring and giving. It's present in communication. And that's appropriate, because our sexuality and sex is not a result of the fall. God created it, and God created it within us to be good. And so there is a proper way to express it. There's a proper way to express it that is beneficial, not just for me, but for you and for everybody. There is a way to express it. I mean, properly un understood, it's, it's what, part of what it means to be created in God's image. He gave us physical bodies. He gave us distinct genders, male and female, and males uh, relate to each other in a certain way, and males relate to females in a certain way, and females re relate to other, certain, other females uh, a certain way, and sexuality is woven all through that. In essence, what I'm trying to say is that sexuality is not a bad thing. Sexuality is part of our physicality. And God created our physical bodies, and what we do with them and how we view them, it matters. And we see that in other passages in Scripture, like 1 Corinthians 6.13, where it says the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. <coughs> in other words, our bodies, including our sexuality, are meant for the Lord. And so sexual expression is meant to glorify God in some way. What about Romans 8, verse 9? You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And so our bodies... Our physicality, the place where our sexuality resides, is also the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And so we've got some great things going for us when it comes to sexuality. There is, uh, there is light there somewhere. It's not just darkness, and it's not just uh, shameful, and it's not just... Uh, things that we uh, don't talk about and that, that happens when the lights are out. <clears throat> Yet at the same time, sexuality is one of the things, I, I can't think of an aspect of life, I can't think of an aspect of ourselves that has been more distorted by sin than our sexuality. I mean, we have this capacity to be aroused in, in ways that, that we can barely even control. 
Uh, we have the capacity to respond um, in ways that are, are displeasing to God and, and contrary to his intentions. And what Jesus says in this passage is that it goes far beyond just the physical expressions of adultery. And it goes to the very mind. Just like, just like two weeks ago, we talked about how uh, anger is or constitutes a breaking of the commands not to murder. Uh, so today, he says something very similar. He says that lust, which is just the, the thought, the, the pursuit of uh, you know, sexual attraction in the mind beyond the boundaries of where God has, has placed it, that, that just those thoughts in the mind, the thoughts of lust, uh, transgress the boundaries of the commandment not to mit, commit adultery. It starts in the mind. And so what Jesus is saying is that the, the most compelling, the most influential sexual organ that any one of us has is not below the waist, it's above the shoulders. The mind is where all sexual immorality begins. So, in the Bible, the basic rule for sexuality is this. No adultery allowed, okay? No adultery allowed. The command was given, I believe, to protect the institution of marriage, which God instituted in the, the very beginning, when God created Adam and, and God determined that it's not good for man to be alone, and so, so God created Eve for Adam so that they could uh, belong to each other in a mutual sort of way. And he says, Adam, here you go. And Adam says, whoa, man. And that's where the word woman comes from, right? <laughs> so God did this at the very beginning. And the boundaries that he set around our sexuality is that we are not to commit adultery. Now, God's word teaches, and human experience confirms this, I believe, for anyone who is uh, at all objective in looking at this, that when you go outside of the boundaries that God has placed around marriage and sex, that you will not return in one piece. Harm will be done. If you break this command, if you transgress these boundaries, if you, if you do so physically or emotionally, you are not going to come back unscathed. Harm will be done. And if we're talking about, if we're talking about a, a, a sin of the mind, then you can be sure that you are going to come back from that harmed or changed in some way. Now, when you talk about uh, letting that letting that thought uh, blossom into uh, a belief and, and that belief blossoms into the way that you speak and the way that you behave, then others are going to be harmed as well. But uh, even the thought is going to harm somebody. Harm will be done. And so what we have here in this passage is Jesus challenging once again challenging, broadening, uh, deepening the command not to commit adultery. Because at the time of Jesus, uh, the understanding of this commandment was not at all how Jesus uh, properly interpreted it. Now the basic rule or the common understanding by the time Jesus hit the scene uh, had become actually very, very narrow. So the, the, the view of the, the rank-and-file Jewish man, husband, whatever you want, regarding adultery was this. That adultery was a sin. Adultery was a sin that would have um, uh, more often than not uh, uh, command given to, to keep a, a married woman in line. Uh, it, applied to, it applied to a married woman if she were to have intercourse outside of her marriage. Now, the same standard wasn't, uh, wasn't exactly applied the same to himself. Now, if a Jewish man had sex with uh, another married woman, 
he certainly would be guilty of adultery, but he'd be guilty of adultery uh, against that woman's husband. Okay? However, if a married man went to bed with a single woman or a prostitute, although this was likely not, I mean, encouraged in the society, it was at least uh, socially acceptable. You could, you could get by on that. Now, it's this kind of uh, mental gymnastics, it's this kind of, uh, kind of perverse justifications, uh, this kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? I mean, how many times have I heard people say, people who are engaged in, in sexual immorality, uh, whatever it is, how many times have I heard people say, well, you know what, I know it's wrong, but this is why it's okay for me, right? I know it's wrong, but... I know God wants me to be happy, and, and this is how I'm going to be happy. We do all kinds of things to, to justify our own behavior. And, you know, we do that much more to, to justify our own thoughts. But Jesus, Jesus completely wipes all this away. He completely demolishes this understanding, this interpretation. He demolishes these justifications, these mental gymnastics, these things, these ways around, uh, he, he demolishes it. In verse 28, he says, I tell you that anyone who looks at another person lustfully has already broken this commandment, has already committed adultery in their heart. And so thoughts and fantasies about sex outside of marriage constitutes a breaking of the seventh commandment. So sexual unfaithfulness, again, is rooted in the mind and in the heart. And if you have lost the battle there, you have lost the battle no matter how far it goes from there. You've already lost if you've lost the battle in your mind and in your heart. And my fear, as I look at some of the issues that I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, the issues of, of sex outside of marriage, the issues of... of um, uh, of pregnancy outside of marriage, issues of pornography, such high percentages makes me think that for a lot of people, we just stopped fighting. We've stopped even trying to fight the battle. We, we've said, you know what? I can't do this. I just, I just can't do this. I don't, I, don't, I don't have what it takes to, to be pure in terms of my behavior. I don't have what it takes to be pure in terms of my speech. I don't have what it takes to be pure, especially in terms of my thoughts. It's like, it's like my mind is going crazy. My mind is just going crazy. Shame on us. Shame on us for giving up. Shame on us for, for adopting something, uh, some, some new normative. Like uh, sexual dysfunction, sexual immorality is just, you know, it's just part of the world and, and we got to just navigate that the best we can. And, and you know, ho-hum, uh, I'm, I'm pretty well fine with myself because in other areas, areas of my life, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay. Shame on us. Jesus refuses. Jesus refuses to settle for that. He refuses to stop there. He refuses because God's standards are higher. He refuses because God looks beyond external behavior and he looks into the very depths of our hearts and minds. And God requires purity there in our depths, in our thoughts and in our intentions. And so this these are tough words. These are tough words of Jesus. Tough words of Jesus. However, I, I want you to remember, it says this in Hebrews 4, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. This is, uh, you know, going back to where it says uh, Jesus came uh, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus knows the struggle. If Jesus didn't deal with the same uh, set of circumstances sexually that we do, 
then he didn't redeem it, did he? Jesus came, dealt with the same kind of temptations, dealt with the same kind of scenario, dealt with the same kind of, 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 uh, of, of world and, and the pressures that come with it. Jesus came, and he came to redeem, yes, even sexuality. So we have to have hope. And we should have hope. So what do we need to do? Well, let's, let's just, as I wrap up, let's just define the problem a little bit better. What's the difference between an appropriate attraction between two people, whether it's within a marriage or whether it's outside of a marriage, that, you know, we, we are attracted to one another. God made us that way. Otherwise, we'd all be hermits and we couldn't stand each other, right? What's the difference between an appropriate attraction and lust. I think it has to do with the motivation behind it. Lust is selfish. Lust is self-gratifying. Lust is going on the computer and looking for inappropriate pictures because they make my body feel good. Lust is uh, going out on the weekends and, and trying to, to, to pick somebody up to have, uh, you know, different sexual relations with. Uh, not because you're looking for a relationship, not because you're looking to, um, uh, to, to deepen intimacy or, or deepen a relationship with someone, but because, because it's going to feel good to me. It's going to, to feed my body in some way. It's going to make me feel good about myself in my mind. What about reading some of these, you know, Harlequin me type novels that I have only heard about, mostly just jokes about, but I, I know that a lot of people read them. You know, love stories that, that you, you're reading and you get completely caught up in them, and, and this, is, this is just feeding your fantasy life, and you are, you are uh, role-playing, and you are pretending that you're one of these characters, and you're, you're making these associations, and, and, and you're doing so uh, kind of you know, outside of um, your commitment to uh, your husband or your wife, outside of your marriage, and, and you're just nurturing all of these fantasies uh, uh, that are... Uh, Yes, imaginary, so it seems harmless, but, but is that really doing you any good in the relationships that you do have? It's selfish. Lust wants to possess someone else in some way. Lust wants to, to exploit in some way. And so it comes down to an issue of selfishness. And God wants the community that bears his name in particular to be, uh, to be completely opposite from that. He wants us to, to love and, and work for the good of each other. He wants to invest, us to invest all that we have in, in right relationships that glorify him and that, and that reflect the beautiful relationship between uh, the triune God in three persons that, that has overflowed to us and that we have access to. God wants us to be serious about this. He doesn't want us to be self-centered. Self-centeredness in essence, if we equate self-centeredness with lust, uh, self-centeredness and, and the lust by which we express that self-centeredness, where does it lead? It says it leads to hell. And so uh, two quick things, two quick things that I want to take from this passage. And the first is this. We need to be better as a church and as a community to be honest about this problem. I look at all of your faces out here, I can't begin to guess. I can't begin to guess who has what struggle. Everybody's struggle is different in terms of sexuality. Some people, I assume, uh, struggle a lot less than others. But if this is not a place where we can be honest about our struggles, then we've already lost the battle too. Because... <laughs> selfishness and lust 
and the sexual immorality that, 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 that comes from those things, uh, those are all uh, evil things that, that happen not in community, but that drive us to isolation. And so we need to be honest about our struggles, and we need to be a community that accepts people uh, for wanting to communicate those struggles, and we need to be willing to walk with each other and help each other to heal in that way. Second thing, we need to be absolutely ruthless. We need to be absolutely ruthless. This language that Jesus uses, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. This is strong language. And it's not that Jesus is is advocating any kind of self-mutilation here. Uh, However, he's very serious about this. He's saying, if there are things in your life If there are things in your life that are driving you to thoughts of sexual immorality, if there are are things in your life that are inciting you to lust, you need to be ruthless about cutting those things out and running from them, okay? Maybe it's places that you go. Maybe it's people that you hang out with. Maybe it's situations that you find yourself in. Maybe it's devices that you uh, kind of have free reign over computers or or ipods or phones you can get it anywhere it's all over the place you need to be ruthless you need to be serious about this god says don't give up on this battle i am here for you and the consequences are dire so we need to take this seriously but here's where we're going to close wherever you are in this struggle wherever you are in this battle even though it's not comfortable to talk about, even though it's not comfortable to hear? Why does Jesus bring this up at all? He brings it up primarily to show us that we have fallen short in this area. We have to know that we have fallen short in this area. Why? Not so that we can give up and just resign ourselves to hell, but so that we can run into Jesus' arms as our Lord and Savior because he is the only one. He is the only one that can provide forgiveness and provide healing and provide a way forward that has some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And we can never forget that. Jesus conquers all, not just for himself, but for every one of us as well. Okay, let's pray.